Dave, the stage is yours, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much, Areti, uh, for the invitation and uh, for the very kind introduction. Architects tend to draw what they can build and build what they can draw. In this way, the two ends of the spectrum from design to construction are seen as limiting of each other. And this is a problem. So together with my co-founder, Ian Maxwell, at the Design Office Supermaneuver, we've been working with companies, startups, research groups, universities, scientists, and private clients, the odd ones who are very open for speculative ideas, even galleries, and extremely importantly, in self-initiated projects, to try to tie the ends of these spectrums together, to try to gather an increasing set of needs to combine with our ex already extremely large set of desires and to try to find ways that these things might negotiate so that the two ends are no longer limitations but are actually creative influences on each other. The outcome of these negotiations is quite often a very large number of unique pieces, non-uniformity, and in general, strangeness. We especially like the strangeness. And so a key criteria is to try to find a language that allows all of these differing things to speak to each other so that we may allow these negotiations to indeed enhance the possibilities of the world. To do this, or well, that common language for us is code and computational design. We use it for all sorts of things, from urban computation to structural optimization. And we do it particularly in order to talk directly to robots and to have these strange, uh, often complex outcomes built. And so I won't speak directly to any of these projects, but just to show you the range of different kinds of material, uh, material systems and end effectors and dances that we've managed to uh, communicate or enable through communicating directly with the robot, including here uh, out of the fabrication with polyurethane foam, uh, in order to try to realize these things. But my key point actually is a somewhat a critique of the theme of the conference, this idea that we go from needs to solutions. Because I think in architecture, things happen so slowly that we actually have to have a whole bunch of solutions ready to be deployed as soon as there is a need, and that we need to work through these solutions in a highly speculative way in order that the needs that don't even yet exist can be pre-solved in a way. So I want to show you two projects that have two approaches to this in terms of needs. Uh, and solutions, and the first one actually comes in an entirely speculative, actually academic mode. So this is a project produced by my business partner, Ian Maxwell, uh, with some assistance from me on the side, uh, where we look at reinventing how housing is thought about, not from the pro priority of needs, but from the idea of creating a design system which can evolve its own capabilities. Oh, so I can't click on this because I don't have a mouse. Ah, cool. Okay, great. So basically, we start from the premise that we have these interacting agents. Here we have Craig Reynolds' famous 1982 Boyd simulation, which has nothing to do with architecture, but makes pretty things through local negotiations. What we do first, then, is take the idea of local communication and start to add actual architectural ideas and content. Oh, sorry, can you hit play for me, please? So basically what we do is we program all of these little agents to run around the site. It's a speculative site in New York where the ground condition is the key determinant. Basically, sorry. Basically it's a site where there's a lot of train yards in New York. Yeah, here we go. Great. Uh, this one should be, if you, sorry. It should come up if you click. Cool. But the basic idea is that we speculatively allow a whole series of interacting agents to have architectural motivations. The first one is that they should walk with a certain scale of wiggle. Seems very arbitrary and nothing to do with architecture. But the scale of the wiggle turns out to give the outcome of making a porous uh, morphology of our building. And that porous morphology, yeah, that's it. Cool. So here they are. There's a whole bunch of different things going on. So the, I'll keep talking. I'll dance, in fact. So these agents are going along. They have a very particular wiggle. That wiggle means that as they talk and negotiate and try to 
discover where there are places that I, I can find a good ground condition. Where is there a good foundation? If I have a good foundation, then I start to admit good smells, which makes my other friends start to come closer to me. Not only that, so we start to agglomerate these agents, these architectural agents, near to each other where we have good foundations. They're also able to come off the ground plane. So they start to float up into the air in a sort of elation. They're so happy that there's good ground conditions. And they're also combining. While doing this, they're, of course, doing the funny wiggle walk. And so the outcome of all of this is that we actually get a morphology that has a general tendency towards being courtyards. It has an agglomeration. This is the outcome here. We won't try for that video again. This is the outcome. So you can see the courtyards that have come. They're not uniform. They tend to agglomerate where there are good footing conditions, avoiding the train tracks below. The height, in fact, of all of these things uh, is enabled also by the uh, amount of foundations which have been found. And we get basically a building envelope which has been locally computed to resolve a number of needs, a number of uh, objects. So. Here you can start to see how that envelope has different heights, different densities, and so forth, but is the outcome of these negotiations. Which at this point, for the architects in the room, I'm sure you're all thinking about Le Corbusier. Seems really natural, right? Uh, and we were too. So we took this, the classic canonical diagram, actually not invented by Corbusier, invented in Russia much earlier, but made famous by Corbusier, which here is this diagram that solves three things. The three things are, I put a corridor, the big rectangle in the middle, only on every third floor. That means I just got rid of uh, two thirds of the unnecessary circulation. You see the apartments, which are doing this kind of inverted L. They have two other really good benefits. One is that there's a double height space at each end. So good for architecture, good for space. I have an exciting moment. And the other is that each apartment actually crosses all the way through the apartment building and therefore has access to not natural ventilation, cross ventilation, and also daylight. So just by doing this little inverted L, he solved a number of problems. And for this reason, this diagram has been copied all over the world and always copied, though, like a rubber stamp. We didn't want to copy like a rubber stamp where we would just get the same outcome and everyone would go, oh, well, Corbusier has been here or actually his Russian predecessor. We wanted to reverse engineer that and allow these little agents to run around and try to solve the same situation. If you can, please start the video. So what we do is we now have a new set of agents. They're released along the corridors, which run along the middle. This is a section so you can get a sense. Uh, the vertical line in the middle is the lift shaft. The more or less straight lines are the corridors happening on every third floor, just like Corbusier. And then the wiggly lines are these little agents who are running forward trying to claim space. They have a couple of jobs. They basically want to walk forward, claim a space of their own, not run into their neighbors, and then keep walking forward. When they find a facade, they've done their first success. They've got access to light. At this point, they go up or down. This is the second part, getting a double height space. And then they go and find another corridor. Another facade, sorry. And they're not finished until they've done that, meaning that we have these a range of knotted apartments that then eventually find the uh, other corridor. And you can see that the, some of the journeys are quite, quite uh, peculiar. They're really not just the inverted Ls. They really are this negotiation locally finding the outcomes. And the outcomes are quite strange. If you could progress the slide for me when my... Cool. So here you see it's a very strange outcome. And the, my co-director in my practice likes to say this looks like a lung cancer. Uh, it's certainly a very strange thing. It doesn't look like a normal building uh, in all ways, actually. And you can see the sense of this, how this is very self-aware of being a speculative project. It's really trying to take advantage of the fact that there are no clients and no constraints and no planning authorities. One of the other advantages is that those little race of all these guys trying to claim space is, is negotiation. So if we change the parameters of the negotiation, we get different outcomes. So here you see on the left, all red means almost all the same size apartments. And in this case, they're actually quite close to all of the inverted L's of core. And on the right, especially at the top right, you have a whole bunch of colors. These are the areas of the units. And you can see it's extremely non-uniform. And this happens just by changing the rules of the dance. We can get all of these different outcomes. And I might just skip past the videos. They've not been working well for me. 
So here in the middle of this strange lung cancer-like building, we can cut anywhere in this building and we get something that's, again, very strange. But if we look closely, we'll see that our three preconditions are all guaranteed everywhere. We always have efficient circulation, we always have a double height space good for architecture, and we always have access to natural light and cross-ventilation. So even amongst all of that complexity and strangeness, our basic needs are met. And now for something completely different. This project is a collaboration my firm's been working on for about five years with an Australian technology startup. The reason I show these two projects together, even though they seem exactly opposite, is that they use the same underlying algorithms, the same local negotiations are taking place, only here directed to very specific needs. So this is a lighting control system. Basically what we do is we attach this little baby sensor, a little microchip, to every single light, and we give that light the ability to sense its environment and also to communicate to the other lights. The rules are fairly simple. If I'm a light and I see someone, I turn on. That's like a normal sensor light. Where it gets interesting is if I'm a light and I don't see someone, then I start listening to my neighbors. And I say, hey, did you see someone? And if they say yes, then I say, great. I'm going to turn on to 80%. And then I'm going to tell my neighbors in turn that I didn't see someone, but I saw someone who saw someone. And if they hear that message, they'll turn on to 60%. And so on down the chain. The outcome of this is that the entire floor is covered with a network of intelligence. No one had to program this network yet it performs far better than the existing systems, even where engineers are, pro are paid very large sums to come and program every system and to try to predict what's going on. So at this stage, with independent studies, we're saving 76% of the energy, and we're getting 100% of people saying that they prefer it to other systems. And this, as I said, is the same algorithm, obviously directed to more obvious needs than the previous project, which was highly speculative, but it shows the way these two things interact. If we hadn't done the completely open-ended speculation, we wouldn't be able to bring the algorithms home for this extremely plausible and practical uh, use case. The next project I'm going to show is most important in that it demonstrates the kinds of needs that we have for an ecosystem of supporters of helpers from industry, from research, from academia, and from design, and that if we have these things, then we can actually enable a lot of elements which are potential sitting in research labs right now that are unable to get into the real world. So this project is commissioned by EMPA, a, materials, a government materials research agency in Switzerland, and it's put together of a core team of researchers, most importantly Block Research Group, led by Philippe Block, and the architecture and building systems group led by Arno Schluter at the Eteha. And in fact, the project itself, in fact, build, builds itself around solutions. The solutions exist, but they don't know how to get into the world. So we build this project, and our client commissions us to build a demonstrator to show that these things really are possible and can meet real world constraints. But it takes the enlightened client willing to take a risk, to take longer, and to invest a little bit more money for the first one in order to get these things to happen. So I said the project is a little bit backwards. It starts from solutions and turns into a project. Here are the four solutions. The one on the left is an innovative building system for a very ultra-lightweight, thin-shell concrete roof with adaptive thermal controls. In the middle is an also an extremely lightweight precast concrete floor system. On the right, we have an adaptive solar facade with soft robotic actuated so that every panel can move and talk to its uh, and, and talk to and negotiate with the inhabitants. Okay, so the thin shell roof. I'll go quite quickly through them all. The thin shell roof is, on average, 20 millimeters thick for each of two layers. So a total of 40 millimeters thick is the average thickness of the concrete of the roof. When you add insulation, a heating system, an energy system, we come up to 150 millimeters. This is in Switzerland, where the roofs are typically 750 millimeters to not perform as many roles as what this one does. How do we do it? We do it through a series of complex interacting form-finding softwares, which first find what shape out of literally tens of thousands of bread outcomes to determine which one will work best for us and be able to be that thin. We then have to figure out how this, the cable net, which is also an innovation of construction, a way of building this complex roof without throwing away a whole bunch of custom-made timber. Only the edge is pre-made and predefined. The cables then span in between, and we put fabric in between. But to, to make this happen, we have to know what tension to make the cables before we put the wet concrete so that it sags into the correct final place. 
And only then can we have the confidence to build such a thin roof. And this is the Block Research Group's excellence really coming to the fore. You see there's the added fabric. Concrete comes on top. In the real one, we'll spray. But this is the researchers in the lab already showing that it's possible. And the outcome. This is the one-to-one -one thickness of the real shell. It's obviously a smaller piece. And it works. The soft actuated photovoltaics, every one of these is stuck to a little robot, a little uh, cast piece of silicon-like rubber with three pieces of air, three air chambers that can inflate at different amounts. So each one of these can track. You can guess that the first thing we do when we track is follow the sun. But because we control every individual element, we can also admit that we're stuck to a building. We should allow a certain amount of light in or, or provide enough shade to the occupants. We also are tracking the movements of the occupants. So our definition of open is not horizontal. It's facing the eyes of the inhabitants. So you always see the thinnest edge of the PVs. And these things get out of your way entirely. You almost don't see them. So I'm seeing that time is closed up. So I want to quickly go and just show you some images of the project. As I said, the project is a little bit in reverse. It has these innovations. The last one, which I'll talk only briefly, is a thin shell precast concrete floor. So here, by having the floor have exactly the right shape, it can be reduced to just 20 mils in thickness. It does this by externalizing the tension. We don't need to have traditional reinforcement in the middle of the shell, so we don't have to protect it from fire, meaning we just put as much concrete as we need in compression. It serves as the ceilings of our bedrooms and the floor of the mezzanine apartments above, as shown. It's also what's very interesting about these things is if you go extremely precisely towards the needs, then they become far more beautiful. The material is only where it needs to be, and the outcome is much more evocative of the forces and what needs to happen. So I just quickly cycle through the spatial implications of this. This is an example of where if you come from solutions to a project rather than the other way around, that you get uh, an extremely exciting set of possibilities. So, But I want to emphasize when we see this project that the only reason this will happen, this is going into construction in early 2017. We're about to build a one-to-one -one prototype of the entire roof to practice. To do that, we need the support of industry. We have Wholesome, Seeker, and a whole bunch of other companies investing in the project in order to make the prototypes, in order to learn with us, and in order to help us with their own knowledge. We have the two key research groups who are the starters of the project from the ETHA, Block Research Group, and Architecture and Building Systems. We have my company, Supermaneuver, whose job is to communicate all of the needs and negotiate, in a literal sense, all of those guys' abilities into a successful spatial outcome. And most importantly, we have the client who's willing to say, yes, I trust that all of these things which you're publishing in papers can happen. I know that it will take a little bit longer. I know that it might, in some cases, cost me slightly more, although in many cases, it actually costs less, and they will get a better out performing outcome. But they, they're willing to take the risk and to go with us on this journey. I'll leave you then with this quote from Cedric Price, that even the instantaneous response to a problem is already too late. We must speculate first, find solutions before we even know about the needs. Thank you.